Coming up, opening closed societies. The one consistent theme that I've noticed uh, from working with dissidents for the, for the last few years is that they think that uh, the technology is a huge help to them. Advancing Human Rights Executive Director David Keyes details a new era for dissidents across the world. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. I'm Andrew Nagorski, and the guest tonight, our guest tonight is David Keyes. He is the Executive Director of Advancing Human Rights, a relatively new human rights organization, and of dissidents.org. His goal is to promote human rights in a period where, frankly, we've got terror and tyranny on the rise. So that's no small challenge. David, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And let me start off right away by getting to the vital question. How does someone go from be, being raised in Southern California, being a top-ranked junior tennis player, hitting with Andre Agassi, I'm not making this up, and then now your Twitter bio says you're an enemy of tyranny. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? I grew up in Los Angeles, and uh, I wanted to be a professional tennis player. And uh, I traveled around and played the junior national championships and uh, was really in love with tennis. And then when I went to college, I found a new passion, and that was the Middle East. And I began to read everything I could about the region. Um, part of it was informed by 9-11 and events in Iraq. But I quickly came to the realization, having read a lot of bloggers in the Middle East and uh, a lot of the Soviet dissidents, actually, uh, that there was much to be done to support the world's dissidents, and indeed that there was a link between uh, the freedom of uh, countries around the world and the safety of uh, democracies everywhere. Um, and so even in college, I ran a group called Students Against Dictators. I studied Arabic. I went to every pro and anti-protest you could possibly imagine. And uh, I really became animated by the idea of uh, how uh, the free world could support uh, democratic dissidents abroad. Um, I began to write for the college paper and uh, eventually, uh, I moved to Israel with my family about 10 years ago. And uh, after my military service there, I uh, sat down in a cafe and uh, said, what can I do to support the world's dissidents? And um, the first uh, group that I started was called Cyber Dissidents. And uh, I was working for Natan Sharansky at the time, the great Soviet dissident who spent nine years in the Gulag. And uh, we thought together about new opportunities to support dissidents. So it's a bit of a of a departure from the tennis court, but um, you know, I'm happy nonetheless. Well, not not Sharansky, of course, was an iconic dissident uh, of that era, and all of us who cover that era remember him well. But what is it, in particular, that you're saying that you discussed with him or with others like him that you could bring to the human rights movement that doesn't already exist? Yeah. Well. Uh, back in 2009, um, we realized that there were a lot of really brave online activists in the Middle East who weren't getting the sort of attention that we thought that they needed, um, that it was imperative that the free world understood the profound danger and instability of the dictatorships of the Middle East. If you go back even to 2009 and 10, some of the rhetoric today seems, uh, seems insanely out of touch with reality. Uh, back in 2009, Newsweek said that Assad was enlightened, articulate, and charismatic, and that a benevolent dictator was the best thing for Syria. John Kerry said in 2010 that uh, Assad Syria could be a partner for peace, prosperity, and stability. Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, said in 2011 that Syria was an island of stability in the Middle East. Foreign Affairs said that big protests weren't likely against Assad because he was younger and anti-American, more so than the other dictators of the region. And it just wasn't true. I mean, the, all, of these, all of these countries were profoundly uh, uh, unstable, and they were profoundly dangerous, and the brutality of the regimes needed to be better understood in the West, and Sharansky and I thought that one of the best ways to do that was, much as was done in the Soviet Jewry period, to tell the stories of individual dissidents. Um, and so uh, we highlighted uh, individuals who were on the front lines in Egypt and Syria and Saudi Arabia, um, and uh, I moved to New York about uh, five or six years ago to join with uh, Bob Bernstein, the founder of Human Rights Watch, uh, to start a new organization with him. Yeah. Well, both yeah, Bernstein and Sharansky, again, are these figures who are so well known from the earlier era. But more specifically, I mean, and Bernstein, of course, was a founding chairman of Human Rights Watch. What is it that you were looking to do that the traditional human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, have not been doing? Yeah. Well, Bob um, came out in a New York Times op-ed in 2009 and criticized the group he founded. And 
what the criticism boils down to is a few things. Number one is um, we felt that many of the traditional human rights organizations were spending too much time on open societies at the expense of closed societies. So you look back and you can find groups that did the same number of reports blasting uh, Israel, the only country with free speech and women's rights, as they did against Iran, Syria, and Libya combined. And we thought that that was a, a betrayal of the foundation of the human rights movement. Um, Bob, Bob had spoken very passionately about the need to confront Iran's state-sponsored incitement to genocide. And that was an issue that wasn't taken very seriously amongst many people in the human rights community. Indeed, incitement to genocide is always the, the precursor to genocide. And here you had a leader like Ahmadinejad, who was in clear violation of the genocide convention. And what uh, we were told was that his, uh, his incitement to annihilate a member state of the UN was advocacy rather than incitement because the link between the words and the violence hadn't been seen yet, as if you needed to wait for a, a mushroom cloud to condemn it. Um, then there was the issue of neutrality in war. Bob has spoken very passionately about the danger of uh, calling yourself neutral when two sides are fighting a war and one is calling for genocide and one is a liberal democracy. That seems also a betrayal of the foundation of uh, human rights. Um, and lastly, there was the issue of technology. Was the human rights uh, community uh, utilizing technology to the best of our ability? And we thought the answer to that was no. Uh, we were approached in 2012 by Jared Cohen, who was the head of Google's think tank, and asked to take over a group called movements.org, which had brought together the, the, the best and brightest of the digital activists in the world. And we jumped at that opportunity not only because it, we got uh, some financial support from Google, but we saw a real opportunity to utilize new technologies in order to uh, support dissidents abroad. So over the last two years, we've built this online marketplace, um, a platform called movements.org, which links directly between democratic dissidents uh, in dictatorships and from dictatorships and people around the world with skills to help them. When I first showed it to Sharansky, he said, this is amazing because do you have any idea how long it took me to get even a single journalist to come to our protest with journalists like you? And he said, now, literally, with the click of a few buttons, you can not only alert the world, but you can connect with technologists and policymakers and press. And we're seeing uh, a lot of really interesting things come out of that. Everyone talks about the new technologies. I mean, it's worth remembering that, of course, repressive regimes have used technology to repress and, 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 and fight dissidents for a long time. Technology is more sophisticated now, but it's more sophisticated that you're trying to channel it for the dissidents it's more sophisticated for the authorities, too. So how do those two things balance out? How do you say movements.org, a website, if you look at it, which says, I'll, we'll connect dissidents anywhere in the world, and you can do it at various levels of anonymity if you want to, as I understand it. What are the guarantees? I think that uh, technology today has given dissidents unparalleled power, uh, but the issues have changed significantly. Um, in the Soviet era, it was exceedingly difficult to alert the world of what was happening. Uh, one study that I read said that from 1950 to uh, 1975, I think only 1,500 pieces of Samizdat underground literature were brought out of the Soviet Union for the West to understand what was happening be behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, and journalists like yourself played a critical role in telling the world and telling their stories. Today, there's, there's no hiding what's happening in Syria because every second or two, a new video is posted on YouTube of a slaughter. So the challenge has changed from getting information out of closed societies more toward how to empower those uh, with, with maximum backing who can really uh, affect change in those societies. Um, so what we tried to do at Movements was to provide a one-stop shop platform where a dissident can log in, and you're right, they can use their name and they cannot use their name. There's a star ranking system for how much information you put or whether we know you in advance. Um, and we tried to apply the, the power of the crowd. Crowdsourcing is an incredibly um, impactful thing, which uh, you know, we all use every day when you go to Amazon and you buy a book from whoever it is selling it, or you go to eBay or you go to Airbnb or whatever the site is that links people from around the world. I think that the human rights movement is stuck a little bit a few years back. Um, a lot of long form reports still. Um, and I think there's just more powerful ways of getting tools in the hands of those um, who need it. You think about how we can tip the balance away from the regimes and more towards the dissidents. Right now, the regimes have all the money. They have billions of dollars that they spend in PR and at Monitor Group or Hill and Knowlton or Corvus, the Saudis are, you know, have spent so much money on. Who counters that? And what's the best way to counter that? Well, one way is for every PR agent in the world to be able to talk directly with a democratic dissident to take up his case and to make sure that the world knows about uh, his struggle. 
Um, you look at issues of uh, technology, certainly it's so difficult when you're up against the Iranian cyber army uh, or the Chinese who can crack anything. Uh, but the one consistent theme that I've noticed uh, from working with dissidents for the, for the last few years is that um, almost across the board, they think that uh, the technology is a huge help to them. Um, and even though you have the regimes, the, the, the cat and mouse game is always there, but there's something to be said for the fact that you can now put your words online and potentially have it seen by the whole world. The converse of that, though, and the downside of it is that uh, in the Soviet era, people knew the names of Sakharov and Havel and Sharansky, and you had 250,000 people on the Washington Mall. Nowadays, you can't name an Iranian blogger in prison. Well, isn't that part of the saga of the digital age, that there's so much more information out there, but the information that sticks is, seems to be less and less. And yeah. uh, I mean, that's, and isn't one of the things you're facing is, for lack of a better word, human rights fatigue in an age of YouTube videos of beheadings, of mass killings, and so forth, is the world really watching? And, you know, and then, even if they are, what do people conclude from that about their own role? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, there's so much information out there, and you're, you're right, there's a bit of fatigue, and also there's a kind of a, a new isolationism, I think, sweeping uh, certainly America, where people said, enough of Iraq, enough of Afghanistan, if it happens over there, not our problem. Sure, we'd like you know, human rights to be strengthened, but we're not willing to, to really pay a price for it. Um, and I think that uh, our job needs to be to, to both emphasize the, the moral duty of the free world to stand up for democratic dissidents, but also the strategic benefit. So I think that when, when publics in the West better understand that, both the inherent brutality of the dictatorships, so we shouldn't whitewash their crimes, we shouldn't go around pretending that Sisi is a good guy, um, we shouldn't go around pretending that the Iranian regime is this great kind of reformist regime when they, when they have thousands of political prisoners. Um, so by telling the individual stories of these dissidents, um, we achieve a twofold benefit. We uh, attempt to uh, create a, a, a spiritual and moral recrudescence that the West once again will care about the fate of individual dissidents as, as they did during the Soviet time. Um, you had leaders of the free world, both Carter and Reagan, who started meetings with their Soviet counterparts by listing the, the names of political prisoners. Down the line, meetings with uh, Gromyko and Dobrynin and uh, Brezhnev, and it drove them absolutely crazy. All you have to do is read their memoirs. And uh, there's a memorable line from uh, Gromyko. He was in a meeting with uh, Carter when he brought up Sharansky, and he said, uh, this is, a, this is a, uh, a, a microscopic matter uh, about one man which should be of no consequence whatsoever to relations between our two nations. Um, and guys like Scoop Jackson and guys like Reagan profoundly disagreed. Uh, and the free world was awakened to this issue. Yeah, but counter that, when Anya Politkovskaya was killed, the famed Russian journalist, and Putin said, yeah, she's really of no consequence. That was his first reaction. I'm not sure, did the West really respond to that in a significant way? No, I don't think so. I, look, there's definitely been highs and lows, but when you compare the the ubiquitous feeling amongst dissidents today that they have been abandoned, that they have been isolated, that they have been forgotten about. I speak to people every single day from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, from Syria, who say, you know, I met with uh, Kamal Labwani, who spent 10 years in prison uh, under Assad being tortured, and I met him in, in Turkey on a trip there to meet uh, opposition leaders, and he said, you know, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, you know, called Assad a reformer, uh, and said that he had lost legitimacy to rule in 2012, and he said, you know, what kind of dictator has legitimacy to start with? How is it possible that you lose legitimacy after a decade of ruthless brutality? Um, that really irks uh, dissidents, and I think that it's incumbent upon policymakers, but also the public, which is why we established movements as this platform to give individuals like you uh, with particular skills, whether you're a lawyer or a journalist or a policymaker, you can translate a language, whatever it is. I think. Im immense things can be done when, when the free world is mobilized on behalf of the dissidents. And just to give you one or two small examples, um, one of our board members is Erwin Kotler, who served as Justice Minister of Canada and is still an MP. Erwin asked Gorbachev in 1997 at a dinner in New York City. He walked up to him and he said, I was Sharansky's lawyer, and I'd like to know why did you free Natan Sharansky? And speaking through a Russian translator, he said, wherever I went, nobody would speak with me about what I was there to talk about. I went to the Canadian Parliament in 85 as agriculture minister, and nobody would speak with me about agriculture. 
All they would do is talk about Sharansky. And I left the parliament building and there were placards of this guy, Sharansky. He said it wasn't worth the international price we were paying. That's an amazing admission from the leader of the Soviet Union that all of the things, everywhere I go, anytime I mention his name, people say, oh, let me tell you what I did for Sharansky. I had a bracelet, I went to a protest. You know, we adopted him at my bar mitzvah, whatever it was. But there were so many people mobilized on behalf of the dissidents, and that is just completely lacking today. Um, and if you want to see the effect even today, um, here in New York, I was at a lunch with Mohammad Javad Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister. And after the lunch, I went up to him and I said, Mr. Foreign Minister, do you think it's ironic that you enjoy posting on Facebook when your government bans it in Iran? And he laughed and he said, ha uh, ha, that's life. Just like that. Well, it's life in a, in, a, in a theocracy like Iran, but it's not life elsewhere. And when I asked him, when will Majid Tavakoli be free, one of Iran's most famous political prisoners? He said, I, I don't know him. I published this in the Daily Beast, and within hours, thousands of Iranians on Facebook were haranguing the foreign ministers, saying, how dare you not know who our political prisoners are? It was covered widely in, in the press. The BBC told me it became the biggest story inside of Iran. Within a few days, they released him from prison, temporarily until the media pressure died down and everyone forgot about him again. Um, so you, wh what does Iran and the Soviet Union have in common decades apart? Uh, not much, but even these uh, rejectionist and extremist and indeed incredibly brutal regimes are susceptible uh, to pressure from, from the free world. And they're inherently weak. And I think we have to understand both our inherent strength and their inherent weakness. Um, it's amazing to compare the relative strengths of the Soviet Union back in the 70s and what guys like Scoop Jackson were willing to do to stand up for dissidents, to confront, you know, um, Dobrynin went into Jackson's office uh, and invited him to go meet uh, with uh, Brezhnev. And uh, he said, well, you should know I have to meet with Sakharov if I do that. And Dobrynin said, well, you have to choose. It's either Brezhnev or Sakharov. And he said, I choose Sakharov. And so they rescinded the invitation. Think about today. Uh, you know, the fact that we don't bring up political prisoners' names in negotiations with the Iranians over nuclear talks. General Rowney, who was an advisor on arms control, when he was invited for arms control talks in Czechoslovakia, he said, the only way I will go and do that is if I can meet with Havel. And they acquiesced, and he met with Havel, and then he did the same thing in Poland with Lech Walesa. And on and on. It was a real thing. The, the, the West cared about the dissident issue. But there was one other difference here. Uh, the, uh, aside from all those, the ones you pointed out, was in those days, if you look to the dissidents like Havo and Vamosa and Miknik and, and Sharansky and Orlov, I think everyone assumes these are people who really value the same sorts of things we do, democracy, freedom of speech. They want, they want to be part, basically put it, crudely, the free world. Yeah. And the big question mark in many of the areas that we're talking about, that you're focused on now, Syria, Egypt, so forth, is there that, are there moderates, the point of strengthening moderates? And if so, are they significant enough to counter both the hardliners in power and the radicals who are against them, a classic case being, of course, now Syria, or, or the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt versus Sisi. Right. Um, it's a great question. Um, there should be no illusions about the deep liberalism in entire swaths of the Middle East. There is a reason why uh, the Muslim Brotherhood came to power. They had widespread support in Egypt. I lived in Egypt. I lived in a place called Imbaba, uh, in an Islamist slum that was the center of Muslim Brotherhood clashes in 1992. And you could see the seeds of extremism festering even then. Uh, mein Kampf was on every single street corner bookstore next to protocols of the elders of Zion. Um, you heard all sorts of uh, kind of deep, deep illiberal viewpoints, and some have pointed to the Pew polling when, when you ask Egyptians. And uh, you know, over 80% in both Jordan and Egypt uh, say if someone leaves his religion, uh, you must kill them. They, they must die. Um, and this is a real issue which needs to be taken very, very seriously because Saudi Arabia today is not uh, chock full of uh, Jeffersonian Democrats. That doesn't let us off the hook, though, um, because it's not sufficient to say, well, it's either Assad or Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS. It's either uh, Sisi or the Brotherhood. There is a third way. And part of the problem is that for decades going back, um, the liberals, the dissidents, um, the people who actually share our value, and, and indeed they are there, 
uh, have gotten no support from anyone, no real support from anyone in the world. So you have Saudi Arabia and Qatar and you know, a lot of people in the Gulf massively supporting uh, ISIS. Um, who supports the liberals? It was Hosni Mubarak's regime that got over $50 billion worth of aid uh, in the last 30 years. If for three decades, the, liber the, the, the small minority of liberals, liberals with a small L, people who believe in, in tolerance and, and, and peace and justice and you know, not killing your neighbor for a, for a different idea, um, if they had gotten real support, I think that they would be a lot further along than they are today. You can't blame us for you know, decades-long problems that you know, some of go back to, to religion or family dynamics or social dynamics. Um, but we can't let ourselves off the hook so easily. Isn't there a risk with some of the strategy of uh, lending an American gloss to dissidents? You know, I remember hearing Iranian dissidents uh, speak uh, during the Bush administration of how the, the rhetoric of the war and evil and you know, grouping you know, the axis of evil um, really undermined their message, right? Because it made, it kind of forced dissidents to step into an American box that they didn't necessarily want to be in, a pro-American box. So, so, I mean, how do we support dissidents without Americanizing their cause? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, certainly there's a huge variety of what you hear from people who are on the front lines and, you know, guys like Akbar Ganji uh, have very different opinions than guys like Ahmed Batabi, two Iranian dissidents, both of whom were in prison, both of whom were tortured. I asked this question to Ahmed Batabi, um, who spent a decade being tortured in Evin prison, um, and he was pretty categorical about it. He said the entire world needs to stand up against our our dictators and stand on the side of the distance. They need to vociferously support them at every opportunity, and it has a real impact. Not everyone agrees with that. Um, and I think that there's a middle ground. I, you know, I've found far more people who are delighted when leaders of the free world stand up for them. Ahmed Mahar, who's now in jail in Egypt just before he was imprisoned. Uh, we were in Poland at a conference speaking, and, and he said, the only reason I was released last time was because Catherine Ashton raised my name constantly. And you can find endless examples of people who were really, really thankful, and they, th they thought it was, you know, even back to Batabi, when he stood in front of the judge for the first time, the judge held up a picture of him on the cover of The Economist magazine, the famous picture of him holding a white, bloodied shirt. And the judge said, with this picture, you've signed your own death warrant. And he said, it took me 10 years to realize that that picture is the only thing that kept me alive, because there were people to my left and to my right who no one had ever heard of, who no one cared about at all. Um, and it was the very fact that I was known in the world that you know, made them think twice about uh, just killing me. So I think there are innumerable ways that those names can be raised without saying, hey, this guy is one of us. You know, it's not about that. Um, but you get the same excuse from all the dictators. Back to the Soviet era, you know, everyone said, well, this is an internal matter. right? This, is, you know, this isn't your issue even. Um, and uh, Scoop Jackson. Uh, uh, once quoted uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn's uh, Nobel Prize speech, and he said, you know, mankind's sole savior is that uh, everybody cares about everything, something to that effect, that it, in, indeed it is uh, our issue. And we can't just say, well, we don't want to taint people, because what Batsabi told me is you're tainted no matter what you do. Even if nobody talks about you, you're a CIA spy, you're a Mossad spy, you know, the, the accusations are endless. So I think there's more benefit to standing up um, for these dissidents, even if not, not all of them agree. And certainly if somebody says, look, you know, the family says, look, we don't want this person mentioned, I'm not saying to, to go out of the way to, to piss off the family, but I've just encountered far more people who spent time in prison who directly attribute either their freedom or their success or their hope uh, to the free world speaking on their behalf. We are talking about totalitarian regimes and you talk about the free world. Um, given that we live in a surveillance state, given that we have all these information about since Snowden about NSA surveillance and all of that, to what extent do we still live in a free world as we assume it to be? Or what happens when governments like India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nigeria, who are all democracies by process but have totalitarian tendencies by design, how do we challenge those things? And are these ideas of free world versus totalitarian regimes still the dialogues and definitions we use to go forward? I do think that the notions are still valid. Um, I think that we do still live in a largely um, free world kind of conception. It's not perfect. What, I think what it means is that it needs to be fought for every single day. 
And I think things that you pointed to point to the, to the vigilance um, of our systems, the fact that we know about them, the fact that they're exposed, the fact that there are people fighting every day to keep America free, to keep the, the Western world free. Um, not that it's perfect. You can point to so many regressions and you can point to, to failures in the system. You can point to problems. But, you know, as Churchill said, it's the worst system except for, you know, all the others. There's nothing out there, I think, that uh, can compete with the uh, prosperity, uh, with the stability, with the safety, with the progress uh, of free societies. And I would definitely count um, Western Europe and the United States and Canada and Australia still in that, uh, in that realm. And I don't think there can be a comparison between uh, the states, certainly that I deal with, um, and uh, Western democracies. Um, but you're right to point out that they're far from perfect. I think we all agree that there are still strides to be made on women's rights and minorities' rights and gay rights, and on and on down the list. But the foundations of, of freedom, I think, are still very strong. I mean, in Europe, I might have a, a little bit more of a, a problem as I see kind of a number of uh, insane things taking place, um, everything from not being able to, to wear a hijab in you know, France and universities and all that, to some of the things that are happening in, in Britain. Um, but I come to the robust defense of uh, Western democracies, and I, I think we need to maintain a clear divide between democracies and dictatorships and not, um, not compare the two. The problems in free societies exist in their own right, but um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't compare between uh, you know, the Russias of the world and, and, and you know, America or Western Europe. David, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's a tremendously interesting and valuable what you're doing, and I wish, uh, wish you luck with it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.